morning, everybody. We have some announcements before we get started today. What do you want to say? Sign up for the rummage sale. Sign up for the rummage sale. Online and upstairs. Okay. So sign up online and upstairs for the rummage sale. And then Megan has an announcement too. Cindy? Morning. Um, if you did not see yet in the newsletter, there was information about a fundraiser that is going on only until tomorrow. Um, it's a four day fundraiser, not our doing, it's the company that does it. Um, it's called Double Good, it's a popcorn fundraiser, um, deluxe popcorn, not like, you know, some cheap stuff. Um, but we get 50% of every dollar, every, every sale. Um, so if you could, we would love you to support that fundraiser. If you don't want to buy popcorn, that's fine. There's actually a way to donate popcorn to essential workers on the website, but we still get the funds, which is pretty awesome. Or you can always just donate to the Dominican Republic Fund through the offering. Oh, sorry. It's for the roof project in the Dominican. Last year, we put up all the walls to the new church that we're building, and now we got to put on a very expensive roof. Um, so without that, we can't really continue our project, so we're really hoping to, to reach our goal. Thank you. gives thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. We shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power and make known to all people your mighty deeds. We will tell the world that the Lord has remembered God's promises to Israel. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures for all generations. Fill us with your wisdom and speak to us your word. Amen. Our first hymn is number 104, Christ is Risen, Shout Hosanna. <clears throat> Oh, 
My friends, who forgives all your iniquities? Who offers you the bread of life that will feed your souls? Only the Lord Jesus. Let us come before the Lord, our God, and confess our sins. Father God, we know that you are gracious and merciful, and we are that because we are not gracious or merciful. We hold righteous, and we are slow to forgive those who we take offense. Always, Father God, it is about us. We act out being merciful. We act out being caring. We talk about forgiveness, but it is all just a ruse to get you to be the kind of God we want you to be, rather than being the kind of children you have called us to be. Father God, help us to understand that it is not the volunteering we do, it is not the good deeds that we have on a score sheet, it is not the rules that follow commands as we keep that make you take note of us and from us. For there is nothing that we can do on our own to be worthy of your mercy. The one thing we can do is to be more like you, to be more loving and more forgiving. Help us to be more like you. Amen. And now just a moment of silent reflection. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. My friends, know that through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gracious mercies of our God, that your sins have been forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and bought the pro brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as, as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
on. Okay. They say they say it's working now. So where are we in the church calendar here? Anybody have an idea? Last week was Easter, right? Yeah. Now it's this Saturday day of April. Yes. Excellent. Excellent, it is. So where are we now? In the church calendar year, we're on the other side of Easter. We went through Lent, right? You remember Lent? It's a time when we look at ourselves and our lives, and we try to see how our sin is part of the reason that Jesus went to the cross. And then we had Holy Week. You remember Holy Week? It started with... Palm Sunday, Hosanna, yay, waving all the, the, the palms. And then, and then we have the very solemnness of Monday, Thursday, and Jesus' last supper. And then the sadness of Good Friday when he died on the cross. And then we had Easter, and we had all the joy of Jesus' resurrection and, and rising from the dead. He conquered death. And he conquered sin. Yay! Right? Yeah! He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Now we have the other side of Easter. I want to I talk to you about what's that like. So some of you had 
your spring break already, and some of it was this week. But it was probably a good week. It was an easy week, wasn't it? There, home from school, if you were, no big problems. Things were kind of easy. But tomorrow is, is going back to work for, for everybody. Going back to school, going back to our jobs. Getting back into what we call our regular routines. It's the hard work now. The hard work of the other side of Easter. <laughs> Now we have the hard work of being a Christian, okay? So I want to take a look at what we've got on the other side of Easter. First, some people have a lot of questions. You remember the Apostle Thomas? You remember he had a lot of questions. He wanted to see the holes in Jesus' hands before he would even believe that Jesus was risen. He had doubts. Okay? And that's okay. It's okay if you have questions. That's what faith quest is for. It's to help you discover your answers. On the other side of Easter, you also have all these saints. Look around you. All these saints of the faith that are willing to walk with you on your faith journey. That's something else that you have. The other thing that we can't forget is we have forgiveness. Yeah. Before Easter, the world really didn't know if all of their sins were really being forgiven. But now we have Jesus conquering death and his resurrection and we know for sure we are forgiven. Third, before Easter, there was only darkness. You know what the darkness means? It was nighttime. Nighttime, yes. Creation was in nighttime because it was in sin. But now we are on the other side of Easter, and we have God's assurance and Christ's assurance of God's steadfast love and never-ending love. We are called on this side of Easter to reflect God's love. We are called on this side of Easter every day to reflect God's light and God's love to everyone that we see. It's hard. It's hard work being a Christian. And we all know that it's hard work because we all fail at it every day. But I want to remind you of the things that you have to help you. First, and it goes without saying, that God loves you. Okay? In addition to God's love, you have a couple of other things. You have faith quests. You have your teachers who are willing to be with you every week and sit with you and answer your questions and get answers for you. And you have all these saints around you who are willing to help you walk in your faith. So you have got all of that going for you, but I, I want to give you one more thing, okay? I want to give you a prayer. I say this every morning, okay? I say, thank you, creator God, for giving me this new day. Why don't we do it all together? Thank you, creator God, for giving me this new day. May I reflect your love and compassion in everything I do. Dear Father, God, Dear Father God, give me your heart. Give me your soul. And give me your strength. So that I can love you. So that I can love my neighbor. And 
mind so that I can love myself the way that you do. Amen. And if anybody wants that in writing, I can give it. The second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked in fear of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, sent me so am I sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So when the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord, he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And then a week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house, and Thomas this time was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Here, put your finger here in my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet will come to believe. Now Jesus made many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is, is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, th and that through believing you will have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yes. Don't usually have to prompt this congregation. This passage from John's Good News Gospel the story of, is the story of the culmination of Jesus' first day of resurrection. He is risen. He has revealed himself to Mary Magdalene, and he has instructed her to tell his disciples that he is risen. Mary was awestruck, but she dutifully does just what she is told to do. The disciples are locked in a room hiding in fear, no doubt huddled in their grief over what has happened. And then Mary comes knocking. No, Mary comes pounding at the door. Let me in! I have news! And when they finally let her in, she announces to them, He is alive! I have seen him! He spoke to me! He's risen. This news that Mary brings is, is overwhelmingly good news, but it is received, how shall I say, with a fair degree of shock. They knew certainly that Jesus was crucified. He was dead when they put him in the grave. They buried him. But this news that Mary has brought what, what does this mean? 
They didn't know if she was crazy or, or whatever. So Peter and John run to inspect the tomb. They get there. Timidly at first they stand outside peering in. But then finally that bull in a china shop, Peter, just rushes in and inspects the linens. The tomb was empty, just as Mary had said. But then they returned to their locked room. But when the other disciples looked at them for answers, they only had questions. What did this all mean? And once there, they relocked the doors. Now, grief is a very strong emotion. And it is very real and cannot just be dismissed if we are to understand the motivations and actions of the disciples. Grief can take control of us and force us out of our normal pattern of behavior and push us down a rabbit hole where it can be difficult to see the light of day, much less the light of Christ. So here, in probably the same room that they had celebrated Jesus' last supper, they are locked away in fear and sorrow and grief. But there is one thing I would call your attention to. For the most part, the disciples were there together and they shared their grief in, and fear in community. This is a very human thing. It is a very Jewish thing. It is a very Christian thing. A way of dealing with loss that death brings. But not to be trite, Misery really does like company, most of the time. Most of the time, but not for Thomas. Thomas chose to deal with his grief and sorrow and pain, his own loss in private. John doesn't account for where John was or why he wasn't with the others, so that gives us an opportunity for conjecture. So with conjecture, here we go. Perhaps Thomas could have been at the Garden of Gethsemane, praying for the very same strength and guidance that Jesus had received there from the Father. Perhaps he could have been standing at Golgotha, looking up at this empty cross and wondering what, what had happened. What had gone so terribly wrong, Rechase, retracing the events of that day? After all, it was Thomas who said to the others, let's go with him so that we may die with him also. He might have been asking himself, why wasn't I there? Why didn't I die with Jesus? as I had imagined it would happen. We don't know. John doesn't tell us. More than the other three Gospels, though, John focuses on Thomas and makes him the center of attention of this particular part of the resurrection story. John tells us more about Thomas in these few verses than we can learn anywhere else in the other three Gospels. So I would like to take a an opportunity to take a look at Thomas and ask why, and tell you why I think John focuses so narrowly on him in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. What do we know about Thomas? In John 11, when it's time for the disciples to go back to Jerusalem, Jesus decides to go back there. He wants to stop at Martha's and Mary's and to be with their brother Lazarus, who he has raised from the dead. At that moment, the disciples try to talk Jesus out of returning there. The last time he was there, the authorities wanted to stone him. In their opinion, this was a very bad idea. It was just plain crazy to go back to Jerusalem. No, don't go there. But John tells us it was Thomas who said to the rest of the disciples, let us go with him that we may die with him. 
Thomas is the one whose courage was the strength that the others needed. So what does that tell us about Thomas? First, he has a firm grip on reality, and he was a pragmatist. He was perceptive, and he realizes the dangers of going to Jerusalem. But he also knows there's no talking Jesus out of what he has planned. He knows this man, Jesus, is headstrong and cannot be swayed. He knows that Jesus has a plan. He doesn't understand it, but he knows there's no derailing Jesus from his path. We learn here that Thomas is totally devoted and loyal to Jesus. That is, the real Jesus, the man that he can see in front of him. And that's an important detail to know about Thomas's character in John's story. But we also learn from this brief verse that Thomas has the courage to follow Jesus even to his death, or so he thought. Then he turns to the others and he says, let us go with him so that we may die with him. If this is as far as this is going to go, if this is how he wants it to be, then without hesitation, we must support him and go with him, no matter the consequences. Thomas's devotion and loyalty are a total commitment as close to the point of death that his humanity would allow him to go. Thomas wanted to be loyal to the man Jesus that he could feel and touch in front of him. And maybe Jesus had Thomas in mind when he said to them, Greater love have no man than he would lay down his life for his friends. Maybe he saw that love and devotion in Thomas. And here I'm going to take a little brief detour from John, a little more conjecture. There is a Christian legend, and it's just a legend, that gives us a storyline that Thomas was a carpenter, just like Jesus. I don't know if it's true, but it's an interesting line of conjecture. In my experience, I have come to learn that there are carpenters, and then there are carpenters. I have a brother who is a minister in Long Island, and he, like Paul, is a tent maker with a secular job to support his ministry and his family. He, for a time, was a cabinet maker, and he had done some amazing work. It appeared in the Manhattan Architectural Digest magazine. In conversation, I told him once that I had told a friend of mine that my brother was a carpenter. He was visibly insulted. I am not a carpenter, he said, to which I responded. Oh, really? Well, then what are you? A cabinet maker. I chuckled and asked, what's the difference? About three sixteenths of an inch. In other words, his work needed to be exacting to a fine line. His work demanded no margin for error, no guesswork, no eyeballing, no broad strokes, just very fine calculations and cuts. If Thomas was a carpenter, I think Thomas was this kind of carpenter. You can tell from what we learn about him that he will believe what he sees in front of him if it's presented in fine and exacting detail. For instance, at that final supper, Jesus tried to reassure his disciples that he's going to the Father to prepare a place for them. And he will return for them, and that they know the way. But it is Thomas who says to Jesus, how can we know the way? In other words, I need details. I need more information. Be specific. Tell us where you are going and how we will know the way to get there. Now, Jesus builds for us a character in, or John builds for us a, a character in Thomas that is devoted to the, and loyal to the Jesus, but at the same time, he is demanding of details. In other words, 
Don't tell me the cut is about a quarter of an inch. Tell me precisely to the sixteenth of an inch what the cut is. And Jesus tries to tell him, if you know me, you know the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus tried to reveal to Thomas what he needed when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when I read this passage, I get a visual image in my head of Thomas's reaction. And it's something like us trying to understand Stephen Hawking's diatribe on explaining his theory of bending time and light. I can see us standing there and Thomas listening with his head going, uh-huh, yeah. Wait, what? All right, yeah, I guess. Okay. All this gives us some insight into how Thomas decided to deal with his grief over the loss of this man that he loved and was devoted to. Thomas couldn't find solace in community locked in fear behind closed doors. Whether he was isolating himself in his own pain or retracing the steps that Jesus took hunting for those answers, Thomas was searching for the real hard details that this man Jesus had spoken of. Jesus spoke of the way. Where is the way? How do I find it? He said, I would know it. How can I know it? Where is it? How can I follow him? So when Jesus first appears to the disciples in that closed room, Thomas is not there. Thomas is searching for answers, but because he has isolated himself in his own reality and grief, he has missed the opportunity to find what he was looking for. So when the other disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord, he responds to them with his characteristic demand for exacting details, for some hard visual evidence that he can see and understand. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in them and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Can you hear him saying, I am a master carpenter. I know exactly what size nails were used to crucify him. And I know exactly how large that hole would be in his hands. I need to see them. I need to measure them for myself so that I know to one sixteenth of an inch that it's really him. A lot of us approach believing this way. We think that having faith means having all the details and having all the answers. It doesn't always work that way, and, and in fact, it hardly ever does. Fortunately for Thomas, Jesus was still around to provide him the answers that he needed. But it's not the same for us. For us, believing is believing in things unseen. And that's not always easy. So now in John's story, a week passes, and we have the disciples locked away in that room again. But this time, Thomas is with them. The doors are shut. John is clear about that. And Jesus enters into their midst and greets them. Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas and invites him to put his fingers in the wounds of his hands and his hand into his side. Come, do these holes fit your notion of what size the nails had to be? You doubt that it is really me the real man that you loved, with complete devotion and loyalty. Come now, touch the physical evidence that you need to assuage your doubts. Now, my friends, we have here a moment. It is the critical moment for all humankind. This is the moment when humankind 
witnesses and affirms for the first time the coming together of God's kingdom heaven and God's earth. This is the moment when God's kingdom comes. It is in the presence of the Christ standing before Thomas, and it happens when Thomas utters the words, my Lord, and, and my God. Thomas was the first who was recorded by John or any gospel writer to acknowledge that right in front of him, in a room of believers, was the intersection of God's kingdom come on earth and God's will being done. This is the moment for us to take pause. In that moment, Thomas recognizes not only this man Jesus, his Lord, his teacher, his leader, and his friend is standing in front of him, but also it was his God verse 28, after Jesus prompts Thomas to put his fingers in his wounds, Thomas looks at the evidence and responds, my Lord and my God. Thomas was the first to put it all together into words. Now John closes this story by having Jesus say to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. In this moment, I perceive grace. I feel that Jesus understands the difficulty that Thomas has in understanding and in believing. And he is accepting of Thomas's weaknesses. So in this gracious moment, I believe Jesus forgives Thomas's doubts. Jesus loves those of us who come to him based on faith in the truth of the witness provided by John and the other gospel writers. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. But he also loves and understands those of us who have difficulty. When we need something more and when we need encouragement, when we need bolstering up, for us, he doesn't come in physical evidence as he did for Thomas. For us, he gives us his spirit and his church and his community of believers. He has given us not only the example of his faith in the Father by going to the cross, but also he has given us a community of saints, real people in our lives in whom we can also see his spirit at work through their love and devotion to the Father God. So whether your faith is rock solid like a saint's or wobbly in need of shoring up like Thomas's, know that Jesus still comes to be with you. His presence is real. It may not be a physical one, but his spirit is always here to bolster you up and to lift you up. Amen.
as Colleen will provide a musical interlude, I welcome you or invite you to fill out your prayer card requests and, uh, and usher or ushers will come around to bring them uh, forward so that we can join in our own communal prayer. Okay, I have several joys and concerns. I don't think I've done a very good job of separating them, so I'm just gonna go through them. With the joys that I read from uh, people who forwarded cards, I would like us all in community to respond. Thanks be to God. And with a petition for prayer or a concern, I would like us all as a community to, to pray Lord, hear our prayer. So Florence uh, has a joy that Carmine, after spending an evening in the ER, is doing better. Thanks be to God. Gay is asking for prayers for Michael, who tomorrow will be having surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Vanya is celebrating a joy because she was reunited with a cousin she had not seen for eight years. It was a surprise visit that her husband had arranged and didn't tell her. Came home the other night and there he was sitting on the couch. So, for family, thanks be to God. John Amato, a joy that my sister and brother-in-law visited us from Rhode Island. So for family and closeness of family, John, Thanks be to God. And Leah Corbell, Brad's ankle is broken in three places. I don't know how you do that, uh, Brad. Someone is writing this for Leah? Where's she here? She's downstairs. Oh, she's downstairs? Okay. And her son's getting married next week uh, on, on Saturday, as, as if uh, we didn't know, huh, Nancy? Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, he was walking on the grass and slipped and broke his leg in three places and he's gonna need multiple surgeries. So, uh, you know, Father God, bring, bring, bring those surgeons who you have blessed with extraordinary talents and capabilities, bring them into that room with Brad and, and just give them the, your, the, the strength and the power of your healing touch. Bring that to bear in that, in that operating room and uh, even in, in Michael's operating room. These doctors are talented and you've blessed them, now make it all work. Let that be your healing touch. So, Lord, hear our prayer. Any others that someone might want to add?
So, all right, Tom, like the rest of us <laughs> of this certain age, uh, depends on proper medications to uh, make life enjoyable. So uh, this is not working, and hopefully uh, he can get to a doctor that can uh, fine-tune that and make it work for him. So, Lord, hear that prayer. Susan Williamson? Wilkinson. I'm sorry. Continued prayers for Russell Payne, who is looking for relief and answers as he is still suffering from maddening titanitis. Right? Yeah, I can sympathize. So, yeah, Lord, hear our prayer. Sorry, Susan. Yeah, that was uh, quite a joy. Uh, Matthew Rowe uh, married, you know, Gary and Linda Rowe, their, their, their son. Finally, after four years of dating, married a very beautiful girl. Uh, the announcement card to save the date that we got at the top of it, she had, it, 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 it's about time. <laughs> and she shared in their vows last night that she had composed her vows two years prior <laughs> and waited patiently for him <laughs> to get it done. <laughs> All right. Uh, Paul? Uh, what? what? Oh, all right. Oh, that's good news. You'll be able to run around again. Good news for you. <laughs> and Melody. <laughs> All right, so for, for the Lord's healing touch, thanks be to God. Uh, just for, Jake and I are leaving for the trip, kids free, our first kids free trip this week, so just safe travels, and uh, if the, the kids feel okay, they'll be fine, I'm anxious. <laughs> <laughs> oh Who are they going to be with, Grandma? Yeah. Oh, all right. So a joy of, of being able to be newlyweds again, okay, and uh, a joy for grandmas and grandpas who come and fill in the lurch, okay? Thanks be to God for family. All right, join me in your hearts in prayer. Dear Father, we come to you in prayer to offer glory, praise, and honor to your name, for you alone are holy, you alone are righteous and you alone are worthy of our praise. And Father, we, we thank you for the blessings and the healing touches that you have provided this congregation and our friends over the, the past weeks. And, and, and we thank you. We thank you for being there. We thank you for holding us up and we thank you for, for providing us comfort and walking with us. And at the same time, Father, we, we ask you to be with with those who are, are, are going to need some sort of, of surgical treatment, some sort of doctor care. And we ask you to be in that room with us, to walk with us, to give us courage, to bolster us and, and lift us up so that we can be confident of your presence and that there be positive outcomes and, and, and just relief and, and healing. And Father, we pray these things in the name of your Son, the Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, so now it is a time of generosity. I found this little prayer in one of the devotional booklets that we have here. Uh, and again, it is about the other side of Easter. We are invited to respond to the redemptive loving gift that God has given us. And we are asked to do it with joy and generosity. 
So my friends, with this offering, let us respond to God's gift of salvation and redemption in joy and with great generosity, reflecting on God's love in ways beyond our words. Father God, we return these gifts to you in, in great joy and in generosity of spirit. And we, we put this, these are gifts of ourselves and our, and our tithes in your hands. And we ask that you use it to further your ministry, not our ministry, your ministry in Long Valley, in New Jersey and around the world. Put it together to make your kingdom come. Amen. Amen. Now our final hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today, number 113.
my charge to you this week is this. Tell the world what the Lord has done. Tell the world that God has remembered God's promises and that God has created a new Jerusalem. It is high up on the Lord's mountain where the wolf and the lamb shall lie down together and where the serpent is defeated and where it shall never again hurt or destroy on God's holy mountain. Let us say, God is good. Now hear this benediction. May the God that gives you breath and life bless and guide you on your way this day and every day. Amen.